Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to yet another Legs Matters Live Lounge event. Uh, we're delighted that you're able to join us. And um, so this is an expert insight session. Uh, my name is Leanne Atkin. I'm the proud chair of the Legs Matters campaign, and I'm going to be chairing this event too. I've got with me Denise Wood, who is an independent um, leg ulcer nurse specialist, and she's here today on behalf of 3M, who's kindly sponsoring this session. So this session is relation to challenges of chronic lower limb edema. There's going to be about a 40 minute presentation, but then around 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Both myself and Denise are here live. So if you've got any questions, please, please be posting them throughout the video in either the chat function or the question and answer function. And we'll get to your questions at the end of this session. So once again, thank you for taking time to watch this. And Denise, over to you. Well, thank you, Leanne, very much for that introduction. Oh, well, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to listen in, well, at the moment this afternoon on the challenges of chronic edema. Um, and this will also look very much at the impact of chronic edema um, and for the patient and for the clinician. And we know that the key messages this week from Legs Matter are the fact that get ready to take charge. Um, and I actually think that really works quite well for what I'm, I hope to say to you today. It's not going to be primarily a clinical presentation, but rather really a personal and an exploration of the impact of the types of patients that we see in this picture here today, um, which we, we will be exploring in lots of different ways, but really about thoughts and feelings around this as well. Uh, without giving my age away, I've been seeing patients with chronic edema um, since the mid to late late 80s, so for a very long time now in different guises. Um, but today, I want to think that we, we can we can recognise there are challenges and there are impacts for the patient and for us, but there is so much that we can do positively now, and I hope to want to pass this message on and this enthusiasm on to you in the next 40 minutes or so. So we have always start with the bottom line, shall we, about things like chronic edema. And the points that I make on the slide are about understanding the depth and the breadth of this condition. And as a nurse educator, which is obviously part of the role of a nurse specialist, it's one of the really important start points on any of our clinical sessions. And that we need and they need to understand that, that chronic edema and, and leg ulcers are not standalone conditions. They are always, and I know this is absolutely nothing to do with any medical technology, but there are lots of stuff in inverted commas around this. We cannot look at these conditions and just start thinking about what dressing we're gonna put on, et cetera, et cetera. We need to unpick what this is all about. This patient's legs that we see here are an indicator that something is going wrong for that patient. It's some manifestation or some inefficiency somewhere in that patient. So I like to think of chronic edema or a leg ulcer as a window. And that's the way I quite like to teach it, thinking about it as a window. It's a window on what's actually happening. And our skill or expertise or our, our job is to go in and find out what those cause or causes are that have caused these legs to become like this. The last point I, I put at the bottom of the slide and, and considering about taking charge is for all of us as failure to recognize, agree and act will have an impact for the patient, for the nursing team and for the wider health arena. And I think we, we all know that if we don't manage our patients as well as we can, then the impacts and the ripples can be enormous for everybody. And we can see with this patient in this picture that the chronic edema is well established and progressing there are lymphatic changes we can begin to see now also in the lower foot and the toes. And these, as we know, will be progressive. If they're not managed. There's no ulceration from this picture that we can see as of yet, but we can see how vulnerable that skin is to breakdown, how vulnerable that patient is to trauma. And we actually need to start thinking about how to start that patient's journey now and not leave it. So, I think as presenters, sometimes we think about, let's find some really impact type stats for everybody or statistics to think about to make us worrying. And I think all of us that are involved in leg care everywhere will know that there is an absolute huge amount 
of worrying stats that we could put up on any screen for any amount of time. The impact is obvious and the future I think is there in front of us that we need to be thinking really, really carefully about. So while I'm just going to leave those slats there, I'm just going to talk about um, what, what's going on where I am. Um, we, I live near Portsmouth and I work in Portsmouth. And within Portsmouth City, there is no non-cancer lymphedema service. Community nurses in the city are not commissioned to see the patients in the GP surgeries, or they are commissioned to see, as they say, lymphedema patients. The nearest specialist support that we have is over 40 miles away in the north of the county. And this impacts a lot on for a lot of us because just because of the geographical distance, really. And when we ask patients and we want to refer patients to that excellent service, sometimes it is the geographical reason that may be the problem. And patients may be willing to go once, but not willing to go again. So it does, it does impact on how many patients can be seen and how many patients will go. So the CCG in Portsmouth recognised a few years ago um, that there was a gap in support for primary care, um, especially relating to round leg ulcers, and they were concerned about the reoccurrence rates and obviously the cost of this enormous burden to those, those caseloads. So they independent independently um, engaged me as 11 hours a week as a loan support service. So I'm called a support service, but it's me and it's 11 hours a week um, in primary care. And my role was to um, develop education programs, carry out competencies, and obviously to see those complex leg ulcer patients that we know are out there. I'm not lymphedema trained. I've been to many study days and I've listened intently, but I haven't taken formal training in it. And we acknowledge that the crossover with leg ulcers and edema as well is, is irrefutable. And just to say something that I came across once a few years ago, I did once challenge a manager who said to me, well, we don't, we don't do lymphedema. I don't quite understand what she meant by we don't do lymphedema. So I thought about that for a few seconds and just replied to her that at what ankle circumference would she like us to withdraw care? And there was a very, very long silence. Um, and we didn't resolve it and we didn't agree and we didn't disagree and we just carried on doing what we should be doing is that we can't differentiate care when we see these legs, when we see these legs with these problems. One thing will mold into another. Leg ulcers are often the end result. But there's a lot of stages to go for before that. And we don't, we do not, should not differentiate who and when we see with this condition. So again, I, I looked again for defining, defining chronic edema, chronic illness, as we call it, and came up on this slide with a couple of definitions. Um, and I quite like the Mosby Medical and Nursing Dictionary uh, terminology when it talks about it may persist for a lifetime. And I think for many of us in this room, we can only understand that too well. It sounds daunting, but actually we know it's the truth in relation to lower limb disease processes. We know that we may be managing, improving, helping the patient, improving quality of life, et cetera, et cetera. But we probably cannot cure these patients and that would be an unrealistic expectation. What we need to do is the very best we can. But there are loads and loads and loads of people out there that can help, help you and help the patient. And I suspect some of you might be listening in today. And just to say that I've listened to people like Leanne for quite a long time now, and she has often talked about leg ulcer champions, and I just couldn't agree more with her. On my humble 11 hours a week, I need to find those people because I just can't be out there all the time every day. It's not possible. And I've called them different things over the years, my rising stars, my leg ulcer leaders, my leg leaders, my champions. It doesn't matter what we call them, we just need to find them and we need to make the best use and help them as much as we can. And for the clinicians out there, you know who you are and I know who you are. You love treating leg ulcers. You love the impact of reducing some edema in those legs. You love drying up wet legs as we call them. Removing scaly skin is a joy 
applying compression and stepping back and look at it as a work work of art. I think hopefully some of you have got a sly grin on your face now and smiling because that's who you are and that's what you enjoy doing. And it was certainly my light bulb moment back in the 1990s when somebody put a Doppler machine in my hand and a four layer band changing. And I finally realized what I actually wanted to do within nursing. So they can be linked nurses, champions, resource nurses, or just general nurses who've got a natural interest in healing wounds or to improving legs. And I feel really, really strongly that it's the nurse's specialist responsibility, not just to look at complex patients and come up with some really good ideas, but to find those people and nurture them and support them in order to get what we want. They, they are the ones that hold the key for us. So just need to look, and I should look at causation more closely, but within the time frame, we won't be going to, into that into any great depth, and I apologize for that. But I think the, the definition that you see at the top for Christine Moffat back now in 2003, but I see it repeated and repeated again in different studies, is absolutely fab. It's exactly what I want to say. It's exactly where my start point when I'm teaching. And I think this is really true. And what we need to look at, and I've literally only listed six things here, and I say only because each one of them is, is, is a lot of work in itself. But what I want them, people to understand is this is multifactorial. It's all interconnected. They're all interconnected and can be even in just one patient. And so I've really just only scratched the surface here and, and, and listed a few. So how does chronic edema happen? Well, chronic edema results when fluid builds up in the tissues. And as a consequence, as we can see from the slide, of maybe one or more underlying problems. And that in turn then prevents the venous and the lymphatic systems, or the, just the venous, the lymphatic systems, from maintaining that delicate fluid balance within the tissue. If these processes are interrupted or impeded in any way, then that delicate balance and that will, will occur and edema will be the result of that happening. And I say, I've listed some intrinsic and some extrinsic causes, and we know that some medications can cause problems for us with either um, encouraging edema with the patient, or even we know there are some medications out there that can have a causative factor for ulceration. So I think we need to accept there is only one cause, and we need to seek out, as I said before, we need to be detectives to find out which and what is impacting on each other and meet that patient where they are with those. Looking at overall health is really important in order to tackle those problems. I'm just going to, to move on to a holistic assessment. I want to move on to patients and, and patients and experiences in a minute, but I think it would be wrong not to just to tick these boxes with you. Um, and there are many, many tools out there, many assessment tools and and we look at them and we read them and we decide what works for us. Um, but I quite like this one and I've, I've popped the reference there at the bottom left and I've done references and um, core documents at the back of the uh, presentation. Um, so most of what I've mentioned here, you can find later. Um, but this one in the best practice in the community, chronic edema, um, I really like. It's so simple, it's so clean, it's color coded. There's one per each page and you can work through it there's reflective parts in there for the clinician reading it and summaries so I really like this um, and, and use it quite a lot when we're doing holistic assessment um, and it's key and I know the word holistic can be overused sometimes but I don't think there is any other condition and I'm biased that absolutely requires you to look at this patient holistically in every aspect not just clinically not just how they live whether they will come to you, whether they want to come to you, past memories and everything that goes with this. Um, so the, the, the assessment is not just a clinical history, but it looks at wider issues around their pain, their perception of pain. And again, as I said, mood, stigma. I, 
I started doing leg ulcer nursing back in the 1980s and I cannot tell you about the stigma. I couldn't even find a clinic or a clinical area to take us because of the stigma around what leg ulcers would be. And we're told that there might be a baby clinic in the next room or there might be something else going on somewhere else. So the stigma, I can assure you, wasn't just within the public domain. There was a lot of stigma 30 years ago around leg ulcers and the perceptions of what they were like. And thank goodness we've moved on from that. It's really, really important. So boxes one and two that you can see there with our six S's are really about clinical history, social history, leg history. Find out the story of your patients. It's so, so important. We need to know where we've been or where they've been because it might not be us that's been involved at any time in their previous care and we come to this fresh. But finding out what's happened, what went wrong, what went right, what did well, where are they? Really, really important. And that's not something you can do separately. You do that when you care for your patient. We are all experts of conversations, all of us in this room. We can pull out those things that we need to know about them. Talking about life in general, talking about their home, talking about what they have for breakfast this morning, really, really important. And we know when we look at the NHS long-term plans that supported self-care is the key. And I always put the word supported before it, always, always, whether I'm talking to the patient or I'm teaching about this, because that's what this should be. And I remember listening to a, a talk a little while ago, talking about, you know, that self-care is not something we can just give to a patient. We, we need to get them there maybe really, really slowly. Some people will be there straight away and they won't want to come in and see you very often. They'll want to get on with this and do their own thing. And you know who they are. We get really clever at knowing who could do that. But supported self-care, I think, would be in the majority. And we may get there even piecemeal in the end. So it's really important that we get everybody on board and we recognise who those patients are that we can do that with. Um, and then I want to think about, you know, that if in with chronic edema, there's always this intensive care. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. So we don't want them to be immediately in supportive care. Rarely is a patient with chronic edema ready to go into long term hosiery or adjustable wraps. We've got to do some work first. And that's what I always say to them. We need to do a little bit of work. We really need to pull together in this early phase and then we can we can get to where we want to be. Nice little short term goal for those patients and for the clinicians. And that may involve a little more intensive care at that time. Well, I'm sure you will. Um, and then we talk about the maintenance phase, but we need to have that conversation at every, every stage. Site is really important. Site, location, it gives clues to the cause and it gives clues to the feasibility of what we're going to do and informs us where we need that compression and where it may need to be targeted. We need to consider, do we need to treat one leg or two legs? Go back to holistic, think holistic. I get absolutely despondent sometimes when I'm called in to see a patient with a leg with con complex venous disease and obviously significant ulceration because that's probably why I've been asked to come and visit. And then I look at the leg, this, this, this abandoned other leg that doesn't happen to have a wound on it, but the clinical signs and the patient belong to that other leg as well. And I always say to them that what you're seeing today on the right leg to the clinician, not to the patient, may well be happening to that other leg if they were to, to have a trauma to that leg. Look at both legs, by all means treat one, but, but look about to give some love and attention to the other leg as well. It, it just sits there just waiting for somebody to look at it sometimes. And we can get in front of that one and we can do some prevention around that. Educating the patient with the importance of daily skin assessment and identification of risk. Key, identification of risk. If we can get that, that skin into a fairly good condition, we need to be involving them on what can go wrong. And things do go wrong, as we know. How to see what, what infection may look like. How to understand the signs and symptoms of early cellulitis. The importance of some daily skin emollient therapy. Check between the toe spaces look at the state of your heels or involve patients and carers who can do this or carers and family should I say that can do this for them. Do we as clinicians need to look at the skin and restore the skin? We've got work to do about restoration or do we just need to think well it's okay? How can we help the patient and we protect it? 
at least leave it at status quo or try and improve it. Five and six are very much back to bandaging and benchmarking. So looking at size and shape, influencing our compression choices, mo thinking about mobility issues for the patient as we know this is incredibly difficult for them. And we want them to elevate their legs. We want them to exercise, we want them to move, but we have to be realistic with some uh, in some ways with what we, what we find when we come across it. Do we need to involve other agencies and specialist services to help with? Do they need aids and adaptions? Sometimes it's literally getting a commode for a patient next to their bed means that they go back to bed at night. They go back to bed at night and all of us understand the good things that will happen when you can manage to get a patient back to bed and get their legs elevated for a number of hours. One thing, one small thing, and things begin to change. We also need to assess the risk for ourselves and for those caring for these patients with larger limbs. There are many, many issues around thinking about how we care for them and our moving and handling issues. Um, and having worked in leg ulcers for 30 years, um, I, I can tell you that there has been an impact on me as well for doing that care for these number of years. Um, I'm not just getting older. Um, I think there are certain areas that are older than others and that's probably to do with lots and lots of bandaging over the years. And aligned with holistic assessment, we might need to consider some other types of very common complications. And that would be of that very non-medical term called the wet leg. And we know this is a complication of chronic edema. And I think this is really important that, that the work done by um, Lymphedema Network Wales with their chronic edema wet leg pathway is fantastic. And it's something that I can leave with clinicians to have a look at. And we work, we go through it and we talk about it. But really, really important, especially for us that don't have a lymphedema service literally in the next room or the next building to us. So it's very clear, it's very concise, tells us what to do at different levels. So again, I would urge you to seek that document out. And I've referenced it at the back as well. So last around, without talking too much about particular patients, is about the importance of treatment and partnership. And I've alluded earlier on to those attack intensive care phases. I tend to think of it as my attack phase. We're gonna go in with all guns blazing. I tend not to use that term too much in front of the patients. Um, but in intensive care phase, really, really, really key. You know, we're not talking about supported self-care here. We're talking about us impacting as quickly as we can on that patient to get them to where we want them to be. And then the analogy again, for for me is about sometimes, and I don't know if anybody in the room would ever agree with me, but sometimes when you get in the zone and you, you go on a diet and you write everything down and you lose weight and you go and get weighed every week and you're just there, you're in the moment and it's working and you're losing weight. The hardest thing I can talk to about myself personally is to maintain that weight loss. And it's a really nice analogy for for some patients that they've been doing this off and on all their lives, that sometimes it, it's the easier thing to do is to lose the weight the hardest thing in the world is to keep it um, maintained. And I would see this very much uh, similar to when we have to support those patients. And my last little bit in purple there is really important that we continue to support the patients. I never want to hear that somebody who's in ongoing compression and has chronic edema or lymphedema issues um, need, are discharged. They can't be discharged. They need you. They need you. If they only need you twice a year, they're going to need you to help them to measure and reorder and check their skin and check how they are and check their vascular status if that's appropriate. We don't discharge these patients. That's the last thing you're going to do. And for some of us that have been working in, within this years, what we do know is they'll be back and it'll be more painful and it'll take longer to treat and it'll be harder for the patient and it'll be more painful. And we know that each time this gets harder and harder and harder. And I know I'm a great one for analogies and, and, and I'm sorry and I apologize for that, but often some patients need you to transfer that into some part of normal life. And I often talk probably to some of the um, more elderly patients about uh, when you have a puncture on your bike and you have to repair the inner tube. And most of us will remember of our dads holding our bikes upside down and the inner tube coming out and being dipped into a bowl of water to find out where the leak was. And then dad would come along and he would probably put a patch on that. And I say to the patient, what do you do when you've had to patch the same bit up three times? And they say, well, you throw it away and you buy a new inner tube. And I go, aha, unfortunately, we can't do that. 
So we need to look after that first repair. We need to look, nurture it. It's really, really important. You do not want these things to come back. So please, plea from me, do not discharge your patients. I want now to discuss a patient, but I want to discuss it in quite a different way. It's not about a particular case study or anything. I want to talk about this patient and how we feel about this patient from different aspects. So just, just bear with me for this, if you would, please. Now, I want you to look at these legs and look at them really carefully. And I want you to think about them in four different ways. And I'm gonna call this lady Joan. This is not her name, but I'm gonna call her Joan. And the first thing I want us to do is to look at these legs if they were our legs. And I know that might be quite difficult for some people, but actually to think about it as our legs. These are my legs. How am I gonna feel about them? And then I want to think about what Joan may be feeling about them and what she may be saying about them if I was to have a conversation with her. And then I wanna think about what the nurse might think when she sees Joan, what she's actually thinking when she sees Joan come into the surgery that day. And lastly, but certainly not least, what the team may be thinking about it. Because you and I both know, looking at that red statement in the bottom of the slide is that it may take years to actually get these legs in those conditions. This isn't something that's happened overnight. But maybe uh, if we went to bed, one night with our, our slim sh shapely legs and we woke up like this tomorrow, how would we be feeling? And I'd just like to share with you, I, I did this as my own exercise and I'd just like to share with you the, the thoughts that immediately came into my head when I looked at, at, at these legs, if I was Joan. I'm tired, they hurt, they're always hot. The pain never really goes away. I'm embarrassed and people stare at them and I don't want to go out anymore. I'm sick of having bandages and dressings on my legs. I just want a bath again. How did it ever get this bad? My shoes don't fit anymore. I don't bother to go to bed anymore. It's just too difficult. Will I lose my legs? No one really understands. They are all so kind, but they all seem to have so many different ideas. Why can't they just cure me? And I didn't take very long to think of those things that I've just listed. Um, and I could probably go on and on. And I think some of you probably could too. But let's look about if we were talking to Joan now, and what may Joan be saying about that? Because I know that's how I, those phrases were how I was feeling, if I could put myself in her place. And we would ask Joan some questions. Joan, have you ever been trying to manage these legs for a long time? Have you been trying to manage them for a long time? Yes. When did the problem start? I have no idea. I think it started years ago after my children were born. I put on weight. And then I suppose maybe lack of exercise, I just don't know, or I just got too busy. I have to sit down now a lot more than I used to. I used to love walking and dancing in the old days. I know I probably don't eat properly. They're always telling me I don't, but I'm just too tired to have to stand there and cook. I just can't be bothered. But maybe I'm just getting older. Joan, have you or anyone ever succeeded in making them a little better or better? Uh, once or twice, but they always come back and they always come back worse each time. I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm sorry. For me, how many of us in the room now are firing off in as many directions as we can think of because we're looking at Joan and we're hearing Joan and we're understanding Joan. And for most of us, there's a lots of things we could do to help this lady. And I hope that that makes you want to go and do lots and lots of different things from this lady, if only you could. And then thirdly, what as clinicians do we think when Joan walks into the surgery and we haven't really met her before? What are we actually thinking when we see Joan? And I'm not going to read that list out to you. You know this list. You know 
And we, what I do know is that everybody wants to try and do the best for Joan. It's really, really important. And we want to do that. And I think what you may be thinking is what I've put in red at the bottom is that's the one thing that may be inhibiting us. It may be about education and skills and confidence, but we can work with this one. But time, time, and we were talking just before we came on about time, it's really, really important. We can pour money into things, we can pour equipment into things, but we need the time to do this care properly. And that's the challenge that we have. I'm also not going to read this, but this is this is a team meeting. Um, and we know when guest work came out in 2015 and, 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 and we all took this enormous sharp intake of breath. And he talked about with his colleagues about the burden of room care. And I think reflecting back, the word he chose burden is really, really well chosen. And I think you will agree that the enthusiasm and the commitment is never in doubt. It's all the other things that get in the way. And that's the problem. So just to add something to this slide, um, we would be nothing if we didn't work in, in medical and nursing, if we didn't have what I call some um, off the wall humor. And while I was trawling for things to put in the presentation, I came across this. And I have to say, it did make me chuckle a little bit because um, <laughs> some of you in the room, I think might, might relate to this. And the glory of being an independent nurse is the only person that beats me up now is myself. Um, I still do it um, because there's never enough time to do the things I want to do. But actually, I'll just leave you with that thought. And some of us may be relating to that. So now I want to go back to a patient and I'm aware that I must move on and, and think about Ralph. Ralph was a patient that I went to see um, a, a little while ago or quite a while ago now. And he was cared for by the practice nursing team, but they felt that they'd reached a point where there was nothing more that they could do for Ralph. And you can see from his story that's up on the slide as I talk about him, is that, that, that this was quite an unusual case um, and, and, and quite a difficult case as well. And the impact of this patient was absolutely enormous. But we did all meet and Ralph was very much part of that meeting. And we felt we looked, had to look at the priorities. We had clinical priorities, but Ralph also had his priorities. The clinical part was very much part of his but also it was about his home, his social circumstances and his financial circumstances. As I can assure, I, I assure you would realize they were impacted significantly by what had happened to him. But we all did get together and we did allow for each other's, other's priorities. And, and Ralph was absolutely on board with everything that we wanted to do with him clinically. Um, and we all agreed a care plan. We referred him at that time to the occupational therapy department because we felt that he was struggling or he felt he was struggling to get around the house safely and properly. And it was very, very difficult for him. He was working, walking on two crutches. And what he had was lots of friends and family who wanted to help him, really help him. Um, but we needed to make that link really for him because he he didn't seem to want to ask people to help him and I think by having those chats with him and saying that people really wanted to help you people really want to do this for you and and once he allowed them in um there was lots and lots of help and he got lots of interaction with people at home and they helped with the school runs the shopping and everything so that social aspect really did did improve quickly I spoke to a lymphedema specialist colleague, which I, I do a lot because um, I'm often slightly out of my comfort zone when um, I have to deal with not just lymphedema, and this wasn't necessarily the issue here, although he, he did have early lymphedema changes, is about was about the sudden onset and the surgical, the, sur the recent surgery and everything that he'd had. So I did, did have to seek help myself there, and that's absolutely fine. And I also talked to the orthopedic team um, that had carried out the operations and the complexities of what happened to this, this man post-surgery. Post um, there were no further surgical options for him, but they were able to exclude an osteomyelitis. So we were worried about why these wounds weren't healing. Um, and he'd had some serious wound infections, repeated cellulitic episodes post-op, and the chronic edema had resulted from the lymphatic damage, that's what the surgeons believed. Plus the immobility were the key contributory factors as to see his legs like they were today. And you can't really see all of Ralph, but Ralph was a very, is a very tall man and a very, very slim man. So the disproportionate 
um, uh, uh, look of him was quite shocking for him, I have to say. Um, what we were able to do, apart from looking at the wounds and, and managing the wounds and, and, and treating what we saw there, which was slough and local infection, is probably with some support from me, we were able to increase those the compression considerably and start to look at the, all of Ralph's legs. And obviously, can you see where those wounds are? We do not even want to consider below knee, below knee compression. This was exactly at the wrong, his wounds were exactly at the wrong point to consider that we just needed to look below the knee. So it was about taking a big gulp and looking at the whole of those limbs. Um, but he also found it incredibly difficult after a while to get to the surgery. And so what happened in the end is we did manage to heal the wounds. They took quite a long time and we did manage to get the um, edema resolving. It's never been resolved, but it is better than what you see in that picture. And apologies that um, because Ralph went to district nursing service, we lost some sort of before and after pictures with him. But they are, they are not like they were. They never will be like they were, but they are very, very, very manageable. He has somebody in um, to support him for showering because he finds that difficult and he's really well supported by family and friends and he now self manages with his skincare. He's, he's a young man. Well, I think he's young at 54 and he's got great dexterity and he manages full wraps. Um, really adjustable wraps really, really well. And that's the compression of choice for him and it's worked absolutely brilliantly. So I hope you will agree that we all wish Ralph all the luck in the future and I'd, I'd love to catch up with him again one day soon. So we've looked at a lot of the downside, but there are positives and I'm gonna move on really to the positives and what we can do and how we can make a difference. I've written a list here. I'm very guilty of writing busy PowerPoint slides. I've repeatedly been told, but I'm not going to go through them all. You know they're all out there. And that's about what we as clinicians um, and carers can get hold of. And also um, that patients can now access and, and just think of legs matter. We don't even have to look any further from all the wonderful things they do. And I don't leave home without my briefcase full of posters, handouts, leaflets, business cards. I, I love all the graphics. It's, immediately walk into a GP surgery and I can see I can see the graphics and I can see the colors and it's really fantastic so it's about this positive reinforcement but we have never had so many great resources and methods of getting information and learning and training and I've listed them in the in the top bullet point there the one for me Facebook groups I have learned so much if, if COVID has done one possible positive thing to me while I was sitting on my hands not allowed to go into any surgeries it was about the, the support and the learning and and posting a problem and everybody piling in and doing it I if you haven't belonged to a like the lower limb limb clinician support group join it it's absolutely fantastic but you can see all the other mediums that we have and also back to why focus originally was about prevention. Um, I do some slides when I'm teaching about called now, it's called get ahead of the leg ulcer. We don't want the leg ulcer. We want to stop something before it's happening. We don't want established congested legs with chronic edema. We need to get ahead of these. And what came along a little while ago now, nearly, nearly a year actually, was the new National Wound Care Strategy Programme recommendations for the lower limb. And, and this, again, apart from all those other things I've talked about, was another light bulb, really, moment, um, especially for me with teaching. Um, when I read it, I just thought, I, I just get this. It's key. It's pitched at the right level. Um, people can understand it. There's a generic pathway. It's just one page. And I can tell you that all the tissue viability nurses and myself in Hampshire went off to our own silos and started building a pathway that we could interpret that generic pathway into the areas that we work in Hampshire. And we've all done it and we've all got them ratified and they slightly differ according to what, what support and, and who we refer to in our different areas, but they're done and they're out there and we're busy really um, spreading the word, hopefully successfully. Well, I know successfully, I can only speak for my area. And I think this document will influence um, how we care for patients for many, many, many years to come, long after I've, I've disappeared. 
And I've just highlighted on the right side of the slide, the document you can see there on the left, the key things about prevention and earlier intervention. Making thinking about compression, this was another light bulb moment for me, to switch it. Instead of thinking about what we've got and should we think about compression, we have a trauma, we have a problem, compression starts there. It doesn't start when we realize that we're in a little bit of trouble. So it was almost thinking, it's almost thinking about that compression is the default rather than compression could be considered as an option. And that was really important for me. And then looking at the red flags, which so simplified all the reasons that we may not be able to offer a patient compression. Um, really easy to understand. We can unpick them at training sessions. It really, really works. Um, that most of them I think are fairly obvious for the clinician, but actually it allowed us to engage. It wasn't about people's, whether they had an issue with their diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. We need to look at them holistically, but we check the red flags and away we go. Fantastic news, really clear review times. And I put the link down on the bottom there. And we've known since 2015 that we have been able to put some compression on without an ABPI and all the work, the great work that was done on those early best practice documents and Leanne and Joy Tickle were, came up with their flow chart that I used to see in behind every cupboard door in every clinic room in every surgery in Portsmouth and it gladdened my heart to see it because people went to it all the time and looked at that. But we do recognise that a British class one stocking is what I call a rescue garment or a holding garment. And for the world of chronic edema, that which we're talking about today, realistically, we're probably not going to get something amazing happening with that patient. But it was what we had and what we used. And we did get some fabulous results from it. And I think when the, this document came out, what it did was tweak that, that level of compression that we could consider up to 20 millimeters of mercury pressure at the ankle. And it doesn't sound very much, but actually for the general nurse, that did open up lots more choices for her. As specialist nurses, we've always pushed those boundaries of who needs more compression than what actually the ABPI results said or what the chart said, because that's our job. That's our job to do that. And to, and to document that and to stand by that for the reasons we know best and look at benefit versus risk. But for the general nursing practitioner, here it is in black and white. And what that able to, to give for us was to open up other products that we had on our formulary. Well, the only reduced compression we have on formulary or light compression we have was Coban light. So that fitted really well for us. We had British standard liner stockings and British standard um, class one stockings that sat below that, that 17. What we were able to look at by going up to 20 was perhaps the more um, stronger European type liners. And that's been something that we've adopted as well very quickly. And so what we are thinking about, look at the red flags, red flags, no red flags, look at what we've choice. And we might be looking at European liner, class one British stocking, or a light reduced bandage system. And that's simplistic enough to teach patients because what we, apologies, clinicians, we need this to be simple. We're gonna, we're gonna fly in and we're gonna fly out and we're gonna teach them something and we're gonna hopefully convince them, but actually they need to read about that later and it needs to make sense for them. So this was a game changer, I think, with the bandages coming into the arena. And trust me, great things can happen in just those, those first two weeks. It really, really can. And I always think about that old proverb that a stitch in time saves nine. I'm not going to lay, uh, stay with this. I want to move on just to the last few slides. Um, but I think you will all agree a goal without a plan is just a wish. So come up with the goal. Think about what you're going to do and plan it. It's important. And it doesn't matter how big or small it is. It's just about the planning. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'll go back slightly. Okay. And I've just put some steps that we can think about. And I just want to, while I've left that up there, I'm just gonna, uh, just gonna talk about a quote I came across when you do the research for the things that you want to talk about today. And I came across a, a, a quote that we'd all heard, heard about, and it was from a man called John Haywood in 1538, I don't know, 600 odd years ago, or less than 600, and I'd never heard of him. But he was the guy that came up with the saying that Rome was not built in a day. And sort of four or 500 years later, along came another very, 
very clever person who looked at that and reflected upon what John Hayward had said. And he expanded on it and he came up with, Rome wasn't built in a day, but they were laying bricks every hour. And I just looked at that and thought, this is amazing. This is, this is what we're doing. We're not going to start a, a leg ulcer service tomorrow or next week. We're not gonna start a lymphatic lymphedema service next week. We're not gonna have extensive clinics everywhere all over the city. But if we could all do something, if we could all lay those bricks just one at a time in all our little areas that we're working at and work with what we've got and how we can get in front of this problem, we can see that we can, we can eventually build something that's very significant. And he said it was too easy to overestimate the importance of building an empire and really underestimate the laying of another brick. And I think that's if there's any clinicians here working alone or in very small teams, you just think about yourselves as being that, that, that another brick, there's another brick, there's another change, another small, and just accept it doesn't happen overnight. And often, I, again, for me, I'm not going to go into that slide, but I just wanted to jot down um, how I sort of sit down over a coffee um, in a surgery with a nurse that's probably contacted me and saying, you know, we need to do something different here. Got any ideas? Don't reinvent the wheel. Somebody out there, somebody on that Facebook group has done something that you're thinking that you want to do. So just, just even if you use your tissue viability nurse as a conduit to say, well, actually, I heard somebody was doing something like that, or they know somebody that's doing something like that. These, these proposals, these thoughts have probably been thought of before. Let's see if you can find them out there and you don't have to start again. And the other key person in here is number three, managerial sign up. And I know some of us that have been leading in certain services over the years will know that we can all sit around the room and say how important it is to make change and improvement for the patient. But we as nurses need to get into the smart world here and think about what pe other people have other agendas and what do they need to know. And are talking about reducing patient emission, reducing antibiotic uses, reducing cellulitic episodes, healing patients faster, stopping the reoccurrence in, or re reducing them, stopping the multiple pathology that we need to think around these patients if they go off their legs. Really, really important. So by, by using this, what I call the smarter terms, by using the things that we know they need to know because they're the budget holders, we may get what we want from that. Really important to engage them and not just, not just do this at just a clinician level. We need to get managers to sign up. And last but not least, I just want to share with you another, for me, busy, busy slide, but please just read down about the patient that um, I came across a bit late to in Portsmouth because the nurse contacted me to say, I just need to tell you what's happened. I did what I did this, this new thing you're talking about with the national wound care strategy. And you know, do you know something? It's worked. And she said, it's not March, but I was really excited about it. And, and I think that was just one of the best phone calls I had that week. And, and what we need to see is the little bit in red in the middle of the slide is what, she, what, was, what she did and found at that two week review that the leg was significantly drier. And we'd started out or she'd started out with super absorbance, which had, could be discontinued even within those first two weeks. She'd stepped down to more standardized dressing. And more importantly, that just with that, and we, we used the light system, we used Coban light on this patient because of the size, or she did because of the size of the limbs, it wasn't appropriate. And the wetness and the exudate to use, to use a liner or a stocking. And within two weeks, she'd got three and a half centimeter average slimmer calf and 2.4 centimeters. Share it with the patient, show them, draw a chart. You know, it's really important. Look, look what you've done. This is amazing. We've done this together. And the key thing that she said at that time was the patient stated that she felt safer and it was in inverted commas. This is what the patient had actually said. And she felt more looked after this time. And what the nurse said, this was no reflection on what had happened before. It's just that the patient said she felt she was part of a plan and the nurse had shared the plan for her, what she was going to do short term. We knew that this patient wouldn't be healed in two weeks. And you can see from the last two bullet points what, what went on to happen. But the patient could see the journey and see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And she's not there at the moment, but we're, they're getting there. And um, I just think it was a, just a great example of one small little change 
or if you want to go back to Rome, Rome wasn't built in a day, one little brick. And I've just put a couple of tips up there that I use sometimes. Tip two for me that I like, and I might have stolen this from somebody else, I don't know. So apologies to anybody out there that said, well, that was my idea. I can't remember if I made it up or, or I heard it somewhere. But I really love that stepping up and stepping down, but the patient can't step off. And I'm thinking about compression here. So that when we have a problem like this lady presented with, we step up. OK, we know that we've got to go with strong compression. We know we've got to give her robust products to get some some outcome. And when we've got her back to where we think the best place is and she agrees with us, we can step down and look at maintenance for her. But realistically, there may be a problem down the line. We step back up. But what we must say to our patients is we can never step off. And I hope I think that works for me anyway. And I hope you think it does, too. Um, I've listed the core documents there and I won't linger on those because I'm aware of the time and the references. And just to say to finish with is that chronic edema is here to stay as a clinical condition. But I want everybody to know that you can make a difference. Don't look back. We are where we are. More that we can look forward and think that we can make a change, however small, even from tomorrow, even some small change. And then everybody wins. The patient, you your team, your manager, the budget, and obviously ultimately the NHS. So thank you very much today um, for your time. Denise, thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. Um, if you could just stop sharing your screen, then we'll all pop up back up in the middle. Fantastic. And um, some of those bits really resonated with me. Uh, number one, um, um, you've got uh, Nikki out there saying that she loves your quote about Rome wasn't built in a day and I can tell you now I'll be pinching that and saying it is my own welcome. <laughs> uh, because I think it's fantastic and um, there's so we've got a few specific questions and I've got a few for you if that's okay so I think we have to I think the power of your presentation really was the patient stories and the actual how you really personalise your patient stories, which is something as a challenge sometimes within present in mm. presenting. So there's a question from um, Denise referring to the Joan case that you, you, you talked to us about. And, and she asked a really valuable question. How did you manage Joan's expectations to ensure that they were realistic? Um, yes, this is a good question um, because you can see where Joan came to in that story. You can see how far along her story she was. So there was lots of things that may have happened to her in the past that we have to unpick. And we need to think about really carefully where they are at. So it's a start point. And I think if we understand where the start point is, because I may have over egged really all those things she was thinking, but you and I both know, Leanne, that patients can think all of those things, you know, every single day of their lives. So I think it is about breaking that down and finding out what her priorities are and what her expectations could be. And we keep them small. We are not going to expect perhaps Joan ever to go dancing again. You know, we need to think about where, where we can, we, where can we get her to? And so it, it is about talking to her, but it's a, it's, I think the skill is about giving her some positivity about some short term goals that she can achieve. And that may just be about can we help her to eat better? Can we help her in the home? Um, can, can we do something different for her? Um, can we give her more choice as to what she wants and what she can have? You know, is there a way that, that she could have a bath or a shower? It's those minor things. Is it that matter of we can get her to bed at night because she doesn't want to go to bed at night? Because you and I both know that if they can go to bed at night, lots of wonderful things happen, just the fact they go to bed at night. And, and I should say that we are joined by Ruth, as you can see in the little box. Uh, Ruth is a, a, a clinician and an expert from 3M as kindly um, sponsoring this session. So there's, there's another question, um, Denise, on a very similar theme, really, about um, let, let's say of how we work with certain patients in terms of getting the best out of our clinical therapeutic relationship with them. So Patricia's asked a question really about those that are the expert patients. Um, so those who have a reason to avoid all professional advice that they've been giving to them by something else in terms of they believe that they know better. Um, and, and in general practice, she's saying there's very little time 
to treat them and listen to them and change the mind at some times. You know, sometimes she feels like she just wants more time to sit down and give some of them advice and to point the key points out. Um, but it leaves her sometimes in despair uh, that, that she just can't seem to find the way to move forward. Have you got any um, pearls of wisdom um, to give uh, Patricia in terms of how to manage that patient? I think coming from a community nursing background, um, I think I'm on slightly safe ground here to say that if you can go and visit somebody in their own home, you have so many keys firing off from there because you can look at that environment, you can see how patients live. And in the last six years, I've been working entirely in, in primary care and realizing how difficult it is to see a patient in isolation away from their, their own home. And I think some of us will all have known that when we ask patients how they eat or how they live, or do they have healthy, healthy lifestyles? And there's lots of nodding perhaps go on. And, and we as clinicians know there isn't. And I think leg ulceration or, or chronic edema patients have normally had a long journey. So the expert patient in inverted commas is very, very evident with that, with that clinical condition. So that because they've been there, and I think a lot of us have had, well, I've had that dressing. Oh, don't show me that dressing. I'm not having that on. Don't you come near me with that bandage, you know? And we have to have all those barriers. And I think sometimes it's about almost having, if we can spare an appointment that isn't so task orientated. And I know that's a really hard thing to do, but it's all about trying to get patients on couches, trying to get their legs sorted out. It's all task, 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 task. And there just could be that benefit of having that appointment that isn't necessarily task orientated and say, look, is there somebody you can come bring with you today? Ne let's have a meeting next Tuesday. Let's, let's get together next Tuesday, you know, because we've been doing the same thing here for a long, long time now. And I, trust me, I'm doing the best I can, but we need to meet somewhere in the middle and I don't feel we are. And let's just not keep looking about dressings and bandages and stockings and have a real conversation about what's going on. Because we, you know, sometimes the patients feel that the legs are their our responsibility and we've, we, we can't take that on now, you know, um, and more than ever really. So I, I just, my, my advice would be try and have a non-clinical task conversation with the patient. Ask them what's one thing they would like to change because they can't be happy how they are. Go with that. Grab that one thing and run with it. And there's great resources available out there about how clinicians can learn about motivational interviewing and how you can use those strategies to help move those those patients round in, in their ways of thinking. The other thing that I think we often forget is that there is clinical psychologists out there that can help. I appreciate the waiting times can often be quite lengthy, but you know, if, if these patients are gonna have long-term needs in a way, actually working and referring to your health psychologist earlier on in the pathway helps when it gets later on. Um, and I, I love the fact that, you know, that a lot of your talk was really about seeing it from the other side, let's say. We all talk about this holistic management and I've had that conversation as the patient goes out the, the door to my colleague of, how did it get that bad? But do you know what? I never thought that the patients will be asking that. They'll be questioning, like you said, of how on earth did it get to where I am now? And when you said that to me, it just sends a shudder down me to think these poor people that, that are suffering from this. So we've had another question in uh, from Ruth asking, is there any good diuretics out there for these patients as well as compression therapy? Well, what we know with, with, with diuretics, that we, we know the action of the diuretics, um, but in the case of we have venous congestion or lymphatic involvement, we know that diuretics will either have a very short-term effect, but will not have a long-term effect at all. Um, and I, I, uh, I've recently had a, a really a sad story about somebody that had been given more and more diuretics and nobody had actually looked at the underlying problem. So yes, they, everybody, if they took a diuretic, would get some initial diuresis happening where you would, you, it does happen. Obviously it does happen. Most of us are carrying too much fluid around with us. But what we know is long term, that's not going to help whatsoever. You know, this is more about dependency, edema, comorbidities. 
unless of course that patient might be in a heart failure situation or a cardiac failure or a, or a renal issue. So we know that those can be really, really important and we need they need to have that therapy, it's appropriate. But for the venous and the, and the lymphovenous patient, this is not appropriate long-term therapy at all. And in fact, it, it could cause more harm than it could good really. But, but I think that um, the, there can be a tendency to prescribe a tablet to cure them of this. Um, and, and I would just reiterate, you need to understand the underlying cause. There's only a small percentage of edema that is actually associated with congestive cardiac failure or renal failure. They're the only two things that diuretics work on, you know, and, and so therefore you really need to be investigating that underlying cause rather than first off reaching. And even in congestive cardiac failure, there's a great saying to say that, you know, diuretics will only dry up the middle bit, <laughs> you know, it won't dry up the legs. You still need the force of the compression to squeeze the fluid into the middle bit so your diuretics can take action. But they should only be used in patients truly with a, compensatory mechanism of why they've got the, their edema. I wish there was a full cut and diuretics is not the answer, unfortunately. So, so Ruth, can I just bring you into this conversation? Um, you know, um, what would your take home messages of, from this session be to our audience? I would say the take home messages would be early intervention, start that plan, build that plan together with your patients, be on the, I always say um, a treatment plan is a bus journey. You need to go on the bus at the same time and you need to stay on it for the whole journey. If you get off at the first bus stop or your patient gets off at the first bus stop, you're on a backward, you're, you, you know, you're on an uphill journey the rest of the way. So that partnership is hugely important and that understanding that they have an underlying condition and there's not a quick fix here. And hopefully that education, I always say education is power and knowledge is power. And that means if we can empower our patients to understand the signs and symptoms, they may actually reach out for some help earlier. So that's my kind of key takeaways. And wonderfully summarised, Ruth. Um, Patricia's just come back to us and said, thank you so much for a lovely presentation, um, Denise, especially being so realistic about what the nurses are facing in terms of the general practice, in terms of the time constraints and what they can do. Um, she's really going to take home your big brick building of Rome uh, situation. And, and I just want to reiterate, Patricia, Legs Matter is not about bashing nurses or any other colleagues. It's just about raising the awareness. And hopefully by raising the awareness of lower limb, we can all have the time needed to do the job. We can all have that earlier escalation. And, and I'm a great advocate that every bit of chronic, terrible edema and every bit of chronic circumferential leg ulcer all started off as soft edema and a small wound. And just imagine the world if we'd have caught it within the first two to six weeks of it being there. None of us would be facing this challenge and the patients wouldn't be having the suffering that they're currently facing. So thank you all for taking your time. We so appreciate you taking your time to come. We know as clinicians that you are absolutely faced with every onslaught in every direction if you're a patient out there i hope you found this interesting i certainly found it a different way to look at and i'm going to be taking out my six holistic c's with me my six six, six holistic s's that's not easy to say <laughs> and with me i'm really thinking about how i'm going to implement that in my practice don't forget the other session that we've got this evening on the legs matters, matters live lounge we've got a fantastic session with some really prominent speakers in relation to foot ulceration because we're not just about the leg here at Legs Matters, we're about the whole of the lower limb. So thanks again to Denise and Ruth for your time and effort with this. Thanks for 3M for your support and thanks for you guys for watching. Take care now. Thank you.